It, 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 it is Thursday, August 5th, 2021 at 1 32 p.m. And we will open this committee meeting of the Land Use and Natural Resources Committee for the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. Welcome. It is wonderful to see your faces even from a distance. Um, I, before we get started, I think first off, if we can uh, join me in doing the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And Madam Kirk, would you do a call roll, please? Yes, thank you. Just a couple of quick housekeeping reminders. Uh, if you are not uh, speaking, if you could please mute your device, that would be appreciated so we don't have background noise. And then for our committee members that are participating, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom if you'd like to make a comment. I'll go ahead and take roll now. Uh, Director Baines? Present. Ulahan? Here. Clark Kretz? Here. Frost? Absent, Gore? Absent, Harris? Oh, I see Gore. I see her raising her hand. Oh, thank you. I will mark you, you present. Sorry, I think my screen was cut off there. Thank you. Uh, Director Harris? Absent, New? Here. West? I'll note for the record that Director West is logged in and is present. Vice Chair Kennedy? Absent and Chair Gialdo? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you all much. I know before we get started that we are all thinking about our neighbor First, uh, both at the Dixie Fire and now the newest fire in Placer in Nevada County near Colfax. Um, I, I know already, I'm sure as you do, some folks that have lost their home. One of, one of our teachers here in Rockland and, and a retired teacher up in Colfax. So we, our hearts are with them. Um, I'm sure like most of all of you as well, um, I know Rockland PD has been up helping with the evacuations and Rockland Fire at both of the fires, um, sending our, our teams there to help. So. Absolutely, our, our hearts and thoughts are with the folks up there. And, and there's one when we hear ways to help that, uh, that are organized, I know we'll all be there. So we're thinking of them. Um, and, and, and with that, we will move on for our first item as public comment. Do we have any public comment? It's an opportunity for anyone to comment on any item that is not on the agenda. And Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment? No public comment. Thank you. And we will move on to our first action item, which is the minutes from our last meeting. I know it feels like it's been a little while, but uh, hopefully we got an opportunity to look at them and reflect. And if so, I will look for a motion. I'll move to approve the minutes. And that's Supervisor Gore. Second by Baines. Thank you, Directors Gore and Baines. Um, any discussion? And seeing none, all those in favor? Oh, do we need to do a roll call vote? I apologize. We're back at roll call votes. We're back online. Yes, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll do this quickly. Director Baines? Aye. Bullahan? Aye. Clark Kretz? Aye. Frost? Aye. Harris? Absent New? Aye. West? Aye. Vice Chair Kennedy? Aye. And Chair Gallardo. Aye. Thank you, motion carries. And Lynette, I'm here as well, so I'm gonna say aye. And it's Supervisor Gore. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, we will move on then to our first information item. And I, and I can't believe we're, we're, we're back in this mindset, but it is our update on our local housing element. And Dov Payton is gonna be our presenter. All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to be giving a, a brief presentation on local housing element updates across the region. Um, I think you're all uh, pretty familiar at this point, but just a little bit of context setting up front. Um, housing element updates are actually the last step in the regional housing needs allocation process, or RENA, 
That process starts with the state providing each region, including SACOG, uh, what's called a determination of how much housing we should be planning for uh, um, to accommodate our needs um, across an eight-year period. And then regions then develop and adopt a methodology for distributing that number uh, to local governments. We completed that process um, early last year. And then since then, local governments have been updating their housing elements in this last step um, to show how they are uh, zoning enough land to accommodate that number in the site's inventory of their housing elements. So for this cycle, housing elements in the SACOG region were actually due on May 15th. While you're not technically uh, in compliance until you formally adopt the housing element, there is a 120-day, uh, what's called a grace period through September 12th um, before any really major penalties kick in. So local governments in, in the SACOG region, um, they're all sort of in varying degrees of, of housing element updates. Um, I believe the current count is around eight jurisdictions that have already adopted, but um, the vast majority are gonna be adopting in the next month or so before the grace period deadline in September. Of course, there's a, a lot of components to a housing element um, outside of just that site's inventory. It's a, it's a really comprehensive look at your local government's housing needs. It lays out the, the groundwork for, for the next eight years of housing policy um, in your community. And so in order to get a, a better sense of what SACOG member agencies are planning for in their housing elements, we conducted an inventory of, of all of the implementation programs that the 21 SACOG uh, local governments that have public housing elements uh, drafts that are public um, are committing to as part of their housing elements. While the, the housing elements themselves aren't being, uh, are being adopted this summer, many of the, the policy and the program commitments that are being, being made in those housing elements will actually be implemented and, and studied over the next couple of years. So um, this exercise I think is an, an important one to understand the, the policy direction that our region is going on housing. As you recall, the uh, SACOG is standing up a housing initiative called Mind the Gap this year. We've had a, a presentation on that earlier this year. And the idea is to try to, to synthesize um, all of the best practices, the lessons learned, the, the practical policy solutions that local governments can consider as they, as they work to increase housing production. And it does that into these six policy move categories that you see on the screen. For the purposes of this presentation and, and the staff report, we've organized the housing element implementation programs into these six policy moves. The first category is about facilitating a greater array of housing types across the community, what we call missing middle housing. 10 jurisdictions have a housing element program to do this in some capacity, of course, varying degrees of specificity within those 10. Two of the leaders on this issue have been City of Sacramento and Placer County, which is uh, looking to allow for four units per parcel in single family neighborhoods. 12 jurisdictions have programs in their housing element that would relax zoning standards to uh, strategically allow for higher densities as a means of really trying to make multifamily more financially feasible. Um, seven are actually rezoning to uh, at least 30 units an acre um, in some places with many looking to go beyond that, including um, City of Folsom, which is actually using its uh, competitive REAP grant, the Regional Early Action Planning grant that it won to explore higher densities along Bidwell, um, including in some places 50 or maybe even 60 units an acre. Four jurisdictions have programs to allow for multifamily housing um, in their commercial zones. Um, if they didn't already, that is one of the things that we recommended in the Mind the Gap initiative as well. In terms of development review process reform, um, 17 jurisdictions have programs to look at um, streamlining the review and approval process for, for new housing in some way. Um, one point of emphasis across the region that, that we were seeing in this inventory is um, developing what are called objective design standards that provide uh, builders with explicit rules for how they can um, provide housing products that are in line with the design preferences of the community without the, the uncertainty and, and the costs that are associated with a, uh, a highly discretionary review process. Eight jurisdictions have, have programs to make multifamily housing by right, which means projects are reviewed for zoning compliance at the staff level and do not require um, any sort of discretionary hearing. Um, just to shout out a few, these jurisdictions include Rockland, Roseville, Placer County, Sacramento, Sacramento County, Rancho Cordova, Yuba City, and Davis. Uh, moving on to parking, um, 
10 jurisdictions are, are, are exploring reducing parking minimums, which can unnecessarily drive up the cost of building housing. This is a topic we're gonna dive into a little bit deeper as a part of the Policy Innovation Committee on Monday. Uh, most of these programs are to, to study reductions and, and just look at um, what the potential is for more flexibility for specific uses like multifamily housing. Um, the city of Sacramento is, is currently the only one in the region that is exploring eliminating mandatory parking requirements citywide for all housing. Facilitating accessory dwelling units or ADUs, it's probably the, the most popular policy move in the region um, based on our inventory. 19 jurisdictions uh, have programs in their housing element related to really encouraging ADUs. Um, 11 have plans for promotional campaigns. So anything from you know, workshops, um, dedicated websites, ways to sort of get out the word to homeowners. Um, 11 more have plans to pursue what are called pre-approved prototype designs, which um, allow homeowners to select a plan that, um, that works for them and it allows them to avoid the cost of hiring an architect um, avoid the, the holding costs of going through a lengthy permitting process, um, so really can reduce costs for them. And then four jurisdictions are actually looking at creating a new loan program that would help to finance ADUs at the local level, which is really exciting. Uh, the last category uh, is around reducing displacement, funding subsidized affordable housing, and protecting tenants. And that's um, uh, all of those things are sort of a point of emphasis in housing element law. Um, so we're, we're proud to say that all jurisdictions have, have programs related to uh, at least one of those things. Uh, while many were aimed at existing services and, and continuing to, to provide those services, eight jurisdictions do have programs to establish or at least explore creating a new dedicated source of a fund, funding for affordable housing um, and creating a, a housing trust fund at the local level. All jurisdictions um, also had programs related to affirmatively furthering fair housing which is an idea that uh, we talked about at, at our board workshop earlier this year with Stephen Menendian. Uh, many of those programs are, are looking to uh, facilitate more affordable housing in high opportunity areas that historically you know, may have been a little bit more resistant to new housing. So SACOG is, is excited to see so many housing element programs that are looking to, to implement the policy recommendations that we've made in um, the Mind the Gap housing initiative. These are all efforts that SACOG has, has a regional interest in, in bringing to fruition. Of course, the, the housing element programs don't um, usually implement the policy direction. Um, there's this, this follow through step, right, that needs to happen to actually make the, the code and process changes that we talked about. SACOG really wants to be a, a resource to you and your staff as you look to implement um, those housing element commitments over the coming years. So uh, many of these actions are actually already being funded um, through, through SACOG, through the Regional Early Action Planning Grants um, that you've heard um, quite a bit about. Um, they're also supported by uh, regional data products and, and technical assistance um, programs. Every jurisdiction uh, makes use of these resources. We have uh, regular meetings with all of your staff to ensure folks are aware of what we can provide. Um, in addition to sort of the, the normal um, technical assistance, SACOG is following up directly with your staff. Um, once you uh, adopt your housing element, um, try not to bother you too much as, as, as they're going through that. It's, it's quite an effort, but once they're done, we are calling individually um, to determine you know, what, what additional assistance we could provide that would be most helpful for you as you implement those programs. We're paying uh, particular attention to jurisdictions that have programs that maybe express an interest in exploring you know, any of these policy moves, but don't have um, you know, explicit details in, in how the, the policy change will be implemented. Uh, of course, as always, SACOG is, is um, available to provide presentations at, at meetings uh, with decision makers to, to again, support your staff in, in the efforts that they're already undergoing. So uh, just a couple tangential notes I, I wanted to mention before I, I do wrap up here. Um, the first is that you, you may have heard um, Orange County Council of Governments is currently pursuing litigation against the state over Southern California's RENA determination. Um, essentially, they, they uh, believe that the regional number that HCD provided the Southern California Association of Governments um, was not fairly uh, or, or accurately uh, calculated. We obviously can't uh, comment on the legal situation, but what we can say is that our RENA determination back in 2019, um, we had a, a very productive consultation process with HCD 
and we landed on an approach that we thought was was fair and, and correctly applied um, state statute. The SACOG board did have an opportunity to um, object formally to the arena determination and, and chose not to, um, in part because, you know, while we knew that number would be challenging, we believed it was fair. Of course, it's worth noting we are in a very different um, situation than Southern California. Our determination was about 50% higher, while theirs was over 300% higher. And, and that difference is um, entirely due to the existing needs factors that are part of that calculation. So things like overcrowding and, and cost burden, um, those are just so much more dire in Southern California than they are in the SACOG region. Uh, so just the bottom line here is that, you know, we did not challenge our number and we're showing now that, you know, we're up to the challenge and, um, and actually, you know, we're, we're going beyond what is required as a part of our housing elements to do our part uh, to make a meaningful dent in the, in the housing affordability crisis. Uh, the other thing I did just want to mention is that the state has a new uh, incentive program. It's called the Pro Housing Designation where local governments can apply to be designated pro-housing if they make a um, series of policy changes that you know, we know will accelerate housing. And then jurisdictions that are designated pro-housing, they get um, extra points for, for housing grant opportunities. This is a new program, but uh, many of the policy changes that you get points for in that program are, are the exact types of ideas that, that we're discussing today. So um, we will certainly be engaging with you and your staff um, in the future to, to see what we can do to implement our housing elements and um, get as many of our, our members designated pro-housing as possible uh, to set ourselves up for success with grant programs, but, but also just to, to demonstrate you know, in our advocacy efforts that uh, we're doing what we can at the local level. Uh, so before I open up to questions and discussion, uh, James, is there anything else you'd like to add there? Yeah, and I know, um... Chair Geraldo, we've, we've talked a little bit about the Orange County uh, case and maybe others of you have heard about it. I, I, I just sort of, I guess, add to the, uh, add some emphasis to what, what Dobb said. Um, it, it, we went through, we got through those numbers on the, on the arena side. We, we, we got through the determination. Uh, we, did the, we did the allocation in terms of the housing numbers. And now we're at this kind of point where, as Dobb just described to you, I think we're, not only are we adopting housing elements, I think there's some really good things that are included in those housing elements. And our, our, um, I think our take on this lawsuit is for us uh, to focus on implementation, getting the state to be a good partner with us, things like the Green Means Go funding, um, and making sure that we frankly get you all in a good position to become these kind of pro-housing communities so that we get even more benefits. We're we're seen as a good actor in the eyes of the state on the housing side in particular. We really want to keep that position, that relationship, um, and, and really kind of build on it to get the state to do more to help us um, really make sure we can actually implement those housing elements you all are adopting. Well, thank you. I appreciate that explanation because I know that's something that's come up with uh, my council and I'm sure others do having questions to see what was the status and what was the impetus behind the lawsuit. So I appreciate you um, giving us that clarification. Um, moving on then, are there, um, I'll, I'll open it up for questions and I see some hands up first um, with uh, Supervisor Bonnie Gore. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for um, actually sharing with us about the Orange County and that their difference is 500% more than, or 300%, you said more than, than 50%. So that, that I think puts it in perspective. So I appreciate that. Um, my question for you is about local funding programs. And I know in Placer County, we've established the uh, Housing Trust Placer which is a nonprofit. We were working with the BIA to put together a nonprofit to figure out ways we can get funds, um, you know, in other ways other than just, well, creative ways to get funds, right? From businesses, nonprofits, grant funding. What are some of the other ways or other local funding programs um, that jurisdictions are looking at? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I think, um... Most of the programs are sort of, uh, they haven't identified a particular source yet. They're more like over the next year or so, I'm paraphrasing, right? Over the next year or two, the community development department will explore uh, new potential sources of funding. And then sometimes they, they list possibilities, but usually don't land on one in particular. Some of the ones that, that often come up though are bonds, sales taxes, and then one that we recommend as a part of our um, 
our toolkits and our Mind the Gap initiative is uh, a real estate transfer um, tax, uh, which we've talked about a little bit before, um, where sort of you you pay a, a percent of the sales price when you sell. Um, but there's there's a variety of different ways to go about it, and it probably um, the efficacy just depends upon the local context. Great, thank you. And as uh, we move forward with our uh, nonprofit, um, if we make progress, I'll make sure to keep y'all apprised of how that may work. Thank you. Next up is Director Jan Clark Kretz. Thank you very much, Chair Galdo. <clears throat> yeah, we um working with our housing element right now and the um, subject came up about the Orange County and I know some of our uh, uh, people that live in our town were, you know, questioning, you know, the, our town's numbers and, and I wasn't on the board during the time of our arena. So I'm really interested in finding out. And of course, not every town and is the same. And, um, you know, most of our our people are, you know, don't like to hear the state dictate to us what, how many houses we, we need to have. Um, you know, we definitely want to be good partners, but also I think that it would be nice to know that, you know, for small towns, um, you know, that State Cog would be supportive of, um, you know, sometimes not everything fits um, in terms of maybe the, the, the numbers of houses or whatever it is, and to kind of think outside the box um, when you're talking about, all the different criteria. So I think, um, you know, as, as I'm a relatively new member, um, one of the things that I am very, very interested in is, is you know, how the marina numbers are calculated and all that. I know I just missed it all, but um, this lawsuit, you know, it does kind of, kind of bring up some questions um, with our town um, and I'm sure others too, and just want to know that SACOG is a partner with us. Um, and I just kind of wanted to, say that you know our people are definitely looking at this lawsuit and you know so it's good to know that i'll be able to uh, give them more information i appreciate that because the 50 percent higher versus the 300 percent higher is not something that that we know so i'll be sure to pass that on thank you thank you what about director harris oh thank you very much just a real quick question uh, James, you, you, we, you know, we've been talking about uh, designated as a housing friendly city. And I know to all of us in this room, it's a given. That's a good thing to be designated as that. But as we go back and, and talk to constituents or maybe members of our fellow councils and boards, um, is there some specific examples you might be able to provide? Um, what are the benefits of that designation? Oh, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, Brand new program, right? This was a this was a program that was um, created as a part of AB 101 from the governor's budget in 2019, um, and so the the emergency regulations just came out uh, a couple weeks ago, and so the um, there's still a public comment um, period where we can kind of shape um, what it what it looks like and what the benefits are. Currently, it's um, it's it's fairly bare bones in the sense that it you get uh, additional bonus points essentially for um, about three or four key grant programs that um, are administered through HCD um, that are sort of for, for affordable housing, for sustainable transportation infrastructure that accompanies that. Um, we've talked a little, uh, a, a little bit about the infill infrastructure grant program, IIG program. That's another program that you get points for. Um, it is our expectation that this will this program will be expanded to basically any uh, type of funding that HCD hands out in the future. It's it's starting small, but they have made it very clear that they are going to expand this program to basically everything. Um, so I think it's certainly in our interest as we look forward um, to being competitive for state grants to have as many of our jurisdictions uh, be designated pro housing as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I, I do have one. Um, what you mentioned, I believe it was the Folsom or some others that are looking at up to for their designation up to 50. Can you tell me what that looks like? In terms of like the, the building? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it sort of depends upon the configuration of the building, but um, I would say just, you know, a, an estimate would be something like a four story building. Um, to kind of like a, a low-rise multifamily building. 
Um, it sort of, it can depend upon like, these calculations are, are a little bit screwy sometimes because it depends on how, uh, you know, how much land is in the back, you know, it, is it, uh, is the parking underground or is it, um, is it sort of a surface lot? But I think generally speaking, it's, it's probably about a four story building. Thank you. And I see Director Boulihan has raised your hand. Go ahead. Oh, okay, where I'm at, we have um, like a, like in the commercial district, um, folks are trying to open up boarding houses and then there's ensuing parking issues that go along with that. And this is an older district. So that, that's our little bit of a controversy on that. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Don. That was very, very helpful to get us up. Things are changing so quickly that it really does help for us to reach out because I know we're all getting the same questions. So I appreciate getting that background so we can hopefully answer those. My pleasure. All right. Well, we are going to move on. Our next um, item is our coordinated rural opportunity plan. And Renee Devere Oki is going to be leading us in that discussion. All right. All right. Uh, Checking that you can hear me. All right. Good afternoon, Renee Diaroki from your planning staff. Um, and if so, you're pretty quiet, I don't know if anybody else is noticing that. How is that? Is that a little That's better? That's much better. Okay. I'll just I'll do it this way. Um, so today, as noted, we're going to take a deep dive on agriculture and natural resources in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, so this presentation is part of our Rural Urban Connection Strategy Program effort this year, our CROP. Um, which we call our Coordinated Rural Opportunities Plan. So we heard, you heard a little bit about this back in February and May. Uh, so the intention of CROP is to be a resource for making the case for public and private sector investments to reinforce our agricultural economy through a sort of infrastructure and program. So over 10 years of Ruck's work here at SACOG has shown that economic viability really is fundamentally derived from the land use decisions and investment supportive infrastructure that we have, um, even preservation of ecosystem services. So CROP will help us narrow in on these potential implementation opportunities. At our May meeting, we discussed forest health management efforts and how our upland lowland connections influence what's happening on the valley floor in terms of water and agriculture. And so today we're gonna to be hearing a little bit more about agriculture and natural resources in our region and about the University of California efforts in this space as well. And in framing this conversation, and before I hand it to our presenter today, I just wanted to give a quick update on the project. So since we um, last spoke with you on this, we've had one regional working group, um, and this is made up of the six county agricultural commissioners as well as planning staff. And so this was our first meeting where it was a way of initiating the project and getting initial um, direction for future, what we're calling deep dive meetings, where we're then going out to each county, and that's gonna be over the next couple months. And initial feedback from this group has been strong um, that a targeted regional pro approach will help us better position ourselves in this sector for accessing available dollars and coordinating kind of cross jurisdictional challenges. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Trish Kelly. She is our project partner from Valley Vision. Um, she's the director for food, ag and economy and has been helping us with our efforts here. There's Trish. <laughs> um, but I wanna hand it over to our fabulous speaker today, um, Glinda Humiston, who has been a RUC supporter since its inception. Um, like I said, over 10 years of um, RUC's work has been done. Um, she's represented us at both locally and in a national front, some of our conversations that we've had, and it's been a kind of big game changer in our region. So with that, um, I'll hand it off to you, Glinda. Great. Thanks, Renee. I appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to share screen and uh, share a few slides with y'all. Um, there we go. I'm hoping you can see that. Uh, as just way of a little ex uh, extra introduction, um, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time in a great array of different capacities. Uh, early in the 90s, working on more of the conservation end, land use, endangered species, water quality, et cetera. Then uh, going to DC for three years, working for President Clinton, overseeing both NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Forest Service. Coming back to California, getting my PhD, looking at sustainable 
development, particularly focused on ag and food. And then for President Obama, I had the privilege of serving as the State Director of Rural Development here in California for several years, uh, which was a fantastic job. I kind of hated leaving that job, but um, the one I'm in now came up, which doesn't come up very often. So I had to leap on it. Uh, the opportunity to be the um, leader of the Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, Division for the entire UC system. I wanna give you just a little bit of overview of that real quickly before we jump into the uh, Sacramento region uh, deep dive. So this is the division I oversee. It's got a, a really fantastic mission. Uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you can see why I had to jump on it because I, I actually usually defy people to tell me what I can't work on it with that mission statement. Um, between safe, nutritious food, economic success in a global economy, productive in environments and science literacy use development. I mean, you, you really could work on just about anything. And the beauty of that is, is that with the challenges we face these days, we need to be doing more multidisciplinary, multi-partner, multi-regional type of work. And having this kind of broad mission area really facilitates doing that. In addition, we've got a wide array of resources that we bring to this work. And all of these different uh, resources are at play in your region. Uh, at a minimum, we have the Cooperative Extension Specialist and Advisors, that specialist based on six of the UC campuses now, and advisors scattered throughout the state serving every single county. We also have over 300 community educators who deliver programs and deliver educational materials to those communities that our advisors and specialists develop through their research and um, uh, transfer of knowledge. We, we maintain nine research extension centers around the state uh, to be in different bioregions where we do a great many uh, different research projects throughout the year. And then we also supervise the Agricultural Experiment Station. That's a congressionally authorized program uh, that we do receive federal funding as well as state funding. That's predominantly on the Berkeley, Davis and Riverside campuses, uh, over 500 researchers doing everything uh, the entire spectrum of anything related to ag, food, and natural resources. We also have 13 statewide programs and institutes. I'm not going to go into detail on all of them. Uh, a couple that you're probably more familiar with is 4-H, Master Gardeners. Uh, also a recent one, our California Naturalist Program. From several of these programs, we have almost 20,000 volunteers scattered around the state that do a, a great deal of work and, and donate a great deal of time and energy. Uh, we manage the Water Research Institute for the state, Nutrition Policy Institute. We also deliver the nutrition training out uh, in all the counties for folks that are in lower income and, and underserved communities to improve their nutrition and make better use of their food dollars. One of the things we've been doing the last several years, and I will admit this is kind of a bridge for me from my previous position, is a greater focus on economic development. Uh, I've been thrilled to co-chair for the last seven years, the um, Elevate Rural California initiative of the State Economic Summit, uh, which in the last few years has been tied very closely to the Regions Rise Together initiative of the administration. Um, these are four key points there that uh, Elevate Rural California has focused on uh, as we've sought to really uh, elevate every aspect of rural California statewide. And many of these are in play when we talk about food systems as well. So part of that work led us to last or year before last, really doing a deep dive into what was the economic value of our working landscapes. Um, and, and I wanna say it was a, a bit of a surprise to a lot of people that our working landscapes came out as the sixth largest sector of the state's economy. One of the reasons we wanted to do this work is that all too often people really take it for granted and really do not understand how critically important it is to the state's economy. In fact, as you can see here, this, this pie chart, this rather busy colorful pie chart, um, is the entire state's economy in 2018, just about uh, $4 trillion, utilizing NAICS codes 
uh, you know, the, the North American industry classification system. We basically went in and in a very conservative fashion, identified which NAICS codes could be attributed to California's working landscapes. And just as an example of how conservative we were, uh, in that number, there is not a single penny of veterinary services because we couldn't separate livestock from household pets. And we, were, we, we weren't sure which was the larger, we just didn't include it. Similarly, every single penny of retail from the 150,000 plus grocery stores and food markets statewide do not show up in that working landscape slice. Because again, some of that food's coming in from out of state. They didn't come from our working landscapes. I emphasize this because in reality, even though we're tied with finance insurance, we, we probably would have beaten it by quite a bit if uh, we had counted at least a little of some of the other. As you can see over here on the right though, agriculture is really the large uh, number there. Um, one of the reasons these, this kind of data is important is in our messaging to organizations like yourself regionally, local government, but particularly our state government on the need to invest in these resources. Um, I'm going to dive into some details from that report because we, and, and, and by the way, let me back up a second. You, you will note on the top, there is a... Um, a website you can go to and get the full report, including what NAICS codes we used, et cetera. And we did split data out by region. I have provided this uh, slide deck to Renee to share with y'all. So let's, let's look at agriculture, just agriculture, which we split, it was so big, we split it into four distinct industry clusters. The first one being obviously just production. And on the right here, you can see that's a lot of different jobs. And this is an important conversation here and later in this slide deck, as we really look and see what are the job opportunities as part of the economic development. As you can see here, Greater Sacramento's right smack in the middle, which is not surprising considering the type of land you have available. Uh, Sacramento's six counties are never gonna come near the San Joaquin Valley. Those eight counties are just a global powerhouse of ag production, both value as well as jobs and everything else. But when we start looking at ag processing jobs, I think there's some questions here you all ought to be asking yourself. Because once again, looking at those type of jobs and looking where the greater Sacramento region falls, I myself would wonder why are you not higher? Why is LA and San Francisco got such huge numbers compared to the Sacramento region. And, and the same could be said for Inland Empire and others. And partially that's because we still export a lot of raw product from your region to San Francisco, LA, et cetera, for processing. And that is where you've got a lot of opportunity going forward to look at jobs and economic development. It's very much part of your SEDS and crop and et cetera, is to really look and see where are the opportunities for meat processing, bakery, breweries. We've got research going on right now growing barley in the, the Southern Sacramento Valley that's for beer production. And, and as you know, microbreweries are huge things. Consultants, engineers, et cetera. There's just so many job potentials there. Same when we look at distribution. <clears throat> Greater Sacramento, again, comes right in the middle. It's not surprising LA is huge and the Bay Area, which has the Port of Oakland, they, they would naturally be a huge area in this just because of the container and, and shipping traffic that goes by. But frankly, it's really surprising Greater Sacramento isn't above the Southern border and even Inland Empire. But, and part of that is the Port of West Sacramento still predominantly transports in the ag and natural resources arena, uh, bulk commodities rather than containers. And, and I, I had the privilege of many, many years ago serving on a consulting team that was emphasizing the need to modernize the Port of West Sacramento, look at things like containerization and start looking at how to link up to things like just to the south of you, uh, Castle Air Force Base or the Port of Stockton and how to make a regional goods movement strategy that would strengthen Sacramento region's role in these kind of things. And these, these distribution jobs, 
again, it's, it's moving a wide array of not just food products that have been processed, but all of the input needed to come in to do the agriculture in the first place, as well as natural resources uh, activities. And then last but not least is ag support jobs. And again, I just, I myself think Sacramento region probably ought to be higher on this list because look at the powerhouses you have in the University of California Davis for things like research and development, consulting, uh, you know, just all these things you see on this, as well as just providing a whole lot of um, uh, scientific type services, policy program support. I'm not so sure that we actually accounted this as well as it could be, again, because the NAICS codes sometimes are a little ruder and cruder than we would, we would like for this kind of um, analysis. Nevertheless, it gives you some ideas of where there's opportunity. And I don't have to be the only one to tell you this. I mean, I, I'm not telling you something you probably haven't heard before. Uh, a great many studies, the Brookings, uh, uh, many, many, many studies that have happened for the last 12, 15 years in your region have consistently called out food and agriculture as one of your top opportunities for economic development. And in particular, this uh, the SEDS program that uh, SEDS uh, report that you just produced last year, once again, calls it out, as well as life sciences and related ag sciences. Again, that's getting back to that ag support opportunity. And even that future mobility, when you think about Sacramento as the crossroads of Interstate 80, Interstate 5, railroads, Port of West Sacramento, et cetera, there is so much opportunity there for goods movement to be expanded and do it in with clean energy. Uh, so this is something I just want to make sure you all are thinking about as I give you a couple more examples. Um, and that gets into things from your report like future projections of jobs. Now you can see here on the screen that food and ag is in the middle there, the purple one, and it's showing a nice moderate growth out to 2023, um, which is great. But um, frankly, again, that could be higher. And some of it is gonna come, I'm gonna show you later, from looking at where there's synergies between food and ag and the health and life sciences, particularly as people get more interested in precision nutrition and how food is a factor in health and nutrition. Uh, you can start tying it into a host of other manufacturing type activities as well. I mentioned these other studies that you've done. I'm not gonna spend time on them. You're, you're probably more familiar with them than me, but I do make a point of looking at these and have for several years because your region has really been a leader in the state of trying to identify regional opportunities. And, and that's one of the ways um, that sets the stage up for your crop activity right now. I was really thrilled to hear the speaker just before me talking about land use and housing the way he was, because I, I do wanna mention real quickly that um, one of the things to keep in mind about the importance of looking at this opportunity in food and agriculture is not just that it itself has opportunity for economic development and jobs, but by maintaining your farmland in farmland, you actually are saving your communities a lot of money. Um, there have been over 80 some cost of community services studies. Most of them started happening back in the mid eighties up until the mid 2000s. Uh, there haven't been a whole lot recently because quite frankly, they keep finding the same exact data. And it's that graph you see on the right there residential, particularly low density subdivisions, which are actually way higher than 115, cost more in services than they produce in property tax. Whereas your commercial industrial and your farm and forest use far less in commercial community services, fire, police, uh, sewer, water, schools, et cetera, than do residential. And in a region that takes this kind of thing into account as part of your regional planning, it helps keep your costs down for all citizens, urban and rural. It's part of that urban rural connection that you all have been a leader in trying to design. As, as I get into that and move into a couple specific opportunities, 
I, I wanted to share this with you because it, it really does show, and, and this is an oldie, this is about a decade or so old, this particular graphic, <clears throat> but frankly, I've never found a better one to just demonstrate how unbelievably complex global food systems are. And we really are part of a global food system. <clears throat> Products from the Sacramento region go to over 100 plus countries in the world right now. And as you can see, there's, there's politics, there's security, there's environment, there's people, there's money, there's, there's the entire value chain, there's all these different factors. And the reason that's important is that you really have to take all of these into account when you're doing regional planning and when you're trying to design the economic development strategies to take advantage of your particular resources. That's why I have been, as Renee said, such a huge fan of your rural urban connection strategy that was started, I think, almost a decade ago. Um, I have bragged about this all over the state as well as in Washington, D.C. since early days because I've looked at a lot of other software attempts to try to do this kind of regional planning. And quite frankly, there's nothing better out there. And I, I know Rux is not what it could or should be, partially because it's amazing to me how you guys have built this particular software tool with very, very little money, considering what software uh, pieces generally cost. But what's really fascinating about Rux is that you did something different in regional planning. Instead of looking at, here's the city, and the city has a lot of different colors, commercial and retail and housing and whatever. And then everything outside the city was one shade of green. Well, what does that one shade of green mean? Not much, frankly. What Rux did is it kind of flipped that thing on its head and made the city here in white and had a lot of different colors for all the veg vegetation types and resource activities outside the city. They divided it into 28 different vegetation types because there's over 200 crops. You wouldn't, it would be too challenging to uh, do the software for something like that. So you're taking that crop map and tying it into things like what's the water availability, the labor, the trucking, the transportation, the return on investment, and being able to do scenario analysis so that you then can see, oh, so if we have certain crops here and maybe they're shifting, which climate change is causing crops to move right now, where does that mean we could best serve that crop and economic development with certain processing facilities? And where should those processing facilities be best located so they have access to needed infrastructure like wastewater treatment? Where is the best way to make sure our roads are focused on moving that crop? Where, where do our farm workers need to live? Where, do, where are their housing next to urban services they need? This, this tool is the kind of tool that really allows your region to be extremely thoughtful in looking at that. And one of the things this tool did about four years ago, or maybe five, was let us put together a proposal to the White House on Central Valley Ag Plus Food and Beverage Manufacturing Consortium. We were able to show that this particular region, and this is a great region, this is 28 counties, of which the SACOG region is one of four regions that we put together. We proposed to the White House and were selected to be uh, an investing in manufacturing communities partnership around food and beverage. And a great many things have happened with Ag Plus since then in fo focusing on increasing, getting more of these manufacturing companies, making existing ones grow and expand, finding synergies. And for us in the research and development world, finding ways to make them more efficient. For example, one of the things UC Davis has done a great deal of leadership on is reducing the use of water in food processing. And right now with the drought we have on, th that's a critically important activity. Most people don't realize that that plate of food you eat, you, you hear a lot about how much water goes into that plate of food. In most cases, more than half of that water is after the crop is harvested. 
It's, it's that farm to fork activity of processing and packaging and distribution that really uses a lot of water. Being able to reduce that's going to be very important as we deal with drought in the future. The thing though that's also focusing us right now in addition to the work we've done here is a recognition that we've really got to change up our food systems. COVID last year was an amazing shock to the food system. This uh, graph you see on the left, the, the month of March in 2020, in one month, grocery stores increased the need to have food going out the door, throughput by 27%. At the same time, food service and drinking dropped 25%. And our system, our farm to fork processing packaging distribution system at that time was so inflexible, we had a huge problem for a few months. We had grocery store shelves that were empty. People were having a hard time finding things. At the same time, we had farmers plowing under perfectly wonderful crops because they had contracts with processors that sold to the food service industry and they couldn't adjust quickly enough to get into the grocery store because of some of the rules and regulations we have about packaging in grocery stores that restaurants don't have to deal with. I mean, that's just one example of some of the upheaval we're dealing with as this kind of thing happens. The good news is um, it creates opportunity. You know, I, I love that old Chinese saying about every challenge is really, if you flip it over, an opportunity. The challenge for us though, is how do we harness that opportunity? And to do it, what we've really got to do is thoroughly understand all of the elements of an economic ecosystem related to our food and ag sector and, and make sure that all of them, the research, the workforce, the new markets, the infrastructure, access to capital, supply chains, all of it are there, they're functioning, synergies between them are identified and leveraged and we're getting economies of scale and efficiencies throughout the system. That's why I think it's exciting to see what you all are doing with CROP. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look into it in depth because it's a fairly new program you're kicking off, but what's exciting is you're building upon all of this work that went before. I don't know about you, but I'm a really big believer in not reinventing the wheel and not duplicating information or activities you've already got. And that's what CROP is designed to do. You've got $2 billion right now in farm gate value. That's the raw crop that is currently grown in your region. The reality is that number is probably not going to change a whole lot in future years. It'll shift up and down as crops change, but probably not much. <clears throat> it's that number there in the third checkoff, the food and ag economy value at 12 billion. That's when you start looking at all those items I mentioned earlier, the processing, the packaging, the distribution, the inputs, all the value chain and um, uh, industry cluster work around food and ag. And just to understand that a little bit better, I like to use this slide to make sure people really understand when I say supply chain versus industry cluster. So you see that red arrow going through from the left to the right, support, production, processing, distribution. You saw that in the numbers I shared with you earlier for your region. And you saw the kind of activities are in those. Working with your supply chains is usually mostly an effort of identifying where you've got bottlenecks in the system to improve for efficiencies, where there's room to grow and expand. But look at all the industry clusters that touch upon this particular supply chain. That's where you've got opportunity for additional growth and additional jobs and economic development. Goods movement, I mentioned that. I can't imagine many cities better situated than Sacramento with the highways, railroads, and ports you have. Agro-tourism and food. I mean, you're, you're right in between the Sierra and the Bay Area. There's so much opportunity. Technology with all the, the university systems, renewable energy, manufacturing that I've mentioned already. So many opportunities to be 
de developed from the food and ag supply chain moving through here. That's some of the work we're doing at UC right now. <clears throat> UC ANR has been coordinating a wide array of partners. UC Davis's Innovation Institute for Food and Health, Rockefeller, Mars, FME is a Dutch firm that's partnering with us on it. And in particular, we've had a couple large grants now from the Economic Development Agency and the Department of Commerce, where we're really looking to build the future of agriculture, food, nutrition, and health. Now, I just added two words to food and ag, nutrition and health, which really fits well with the life sciences and healthcare opportunities in the Sacramento region. <clears throat> We're looking to move into food 3.0, precision nutrition. You know, individuals have different bodies, different bodies react to different foods differently. That's a, that's a research area that we're just barely scratching the surface of. Supply chain integri integrity and traceability. This is a food safety issue. Again, that we can do huge stuff. Sustainable ag, nutrition security, reducing food waste. We still waste almost 40% of the food out there, both from on-farm losses, but also consumer losses. And then connecting farmers and consumers so that there's more information going between them to make sure consumers are getting what they want and farmers are able to thrive and all the activities in between are thriving and economically healthy. To do that, we've been doing a lot of work lately. This is just one example of a very exciting project. We just received a $20 million grant in this region from USDA, NIFA, and National Science Foundation. And when I say we, uh, our UC Ag and Natural Resources, my group, coordinated with, along with Davis and Berkeley reached out to Illinois Cornell and USDA's Ag Research Service and put together a multi-sector, multidisciplinary team to look at how can we harness artificial intelligence for all these different aspects of the food system. <clears throat> We've already got this project underway. We received the grant about four or five months ago. And it's extremely exciting to think about what the opportunities are and particular for this region. Um, as we move forward in this. But you know, as I talk about things like artificial intelligence, I wanna also say that it's not all pie in the sky, high tech, et cetera. Some of these activities can be really close to home and can take advantage of existing resources. One example I love to share from another region up in Humboldt, they have done some of the most amazing work anywhere in the state on harnessing their county fairgrounds to be an incubator for entrepreneurs. <clears throat> they have opened up little used facilities on the fairgrounds to allow entrepreneurs to come in and make use of the facilities. They actually developed a couple commercial kitchens. They've now incubated over 15 different entrepreneurs and a couple of them have grown so large they had to leave the fairgrounds because they needed more space, larger buildings, because they're growing. Some of them, a couple of them are now having employees of 50, 60 people. A lot of these are small micro businesses, small businesses of five to 10 employees. But again, county fairgrounds can be an incubator. Our community colleges, we could be doing so much more with them. Many of them now have uh, business entrepreneur clubs. Uh, other resources out there. That's one of the things we're trying to do with our Vine, the Verde Innovation Network for Entrepreneurs, is really tie together all these different partners. And this is just an example of, of where we are now. Catalyzing collaboration. Uh, we're doing this statewide, but quite frankly, this is, this is a perfect example of exactly what your region can do and is already doing to a certain degree pulling together existing entities, community colleges, the CSU, the UC, uh, private sector research, uh, private sector entrepreneurial, government, uh, a host of different activities, finance entities. We're doing all of this to focus, catalyze that collaboration on ag and food and health innovation. And in particular, making sure 
that our existing resources, our cooperative extension, our research extension centers, and all of the partners we've developed over the last hundred plus years are part of this. This is what I think uh, is really exciting. I think it's got a lot of opportunity. And I personally am really excited to work with your folks and with the leaders you've got working on crop to move this kind of vision forward and let your region harness all the opportunities I mentioned earlier on the food and ag scale. With that, uh, you, do, you will get my contact info. I'm, I'm hoping to hear from some of you. Uh, unless somebody wants to see a specific slide, I'm gonna stop sharing screen and um, answer some questions you might have. Wonderful. That was a lot to take in and, and some, some surprising info. I kept thinking of all the rice and the almonds and thought we'd be way up there on that list. But uh, I, I really appreciate that information. Let me open it up for questions. Oh, there we are. We're flashing. Hopefully, I just say. I, I am amazed. Either you're still absorbing or uh, you're, you, you discovered it all so well. Oh, I see one from uh, Director Frost. Director Frost, you still there? You're on mute. Sorry about that. I, I just wanted to say, Glenda, uh, that was so inspiring. <laughs> And uh, I really appreciated your presentation because that's one of the things in, in my district uh, and in the rural, you know, some of the, a lot of the areas in the county, uh, there's that concern about, about you know, um, food scarcity or, you know, uh, food insecurity. And, you know, have, after what happened last year with COVID, you know, people, it does make, give you this feeling of, I to the grocery store before it's all gone and is that going to happen again and put you in a different it's like we all have baggage now we're not sure it's going to be there so you know i i think creating these um these uh, um these these opportunities where we can develop an ecosystem that can respond quickly locally is pretty exciting so uh, i took a picture of your contact information and i just wanted to Thank you um, and tell you, I think it's really great um, what you're doing there. Thanks. Yeah, again, it's, it's very exciting. You, you know, I don't know if you all realize, but your region is actually one of the few anywhere that if, if the aliens from outer space put a big giant bubble around you, your six county region, you actually do have the diversity of crops and resources to probably be okay. And that's a very rare thing. I don't, I don't know if you realize that. We're, we're also in, I don't know about others, but in my district, we're developing little local farms, the food bank farm that, mm -hmm. that um, sells to people locally and we pay a little bit more and that contributes money to, to get crops to the food bank farm or to the food bank. So it's supporting the food bank with fresh food as well. Yeah. So it, um, then- But again, you know, Food banks are a great example, just like county fairgrounds, of a resource that's underutilized. Because if you think about most of our food banks, they're a big giant building with a lot of storage shelves, a forklift, and cold storage. That's exactly what an aggregation hub needs. And, and if some of our food banks have unused resources, which actually your Sacramento one does, I know for a fact, because uh, we've talked with them about serving as an aggregation hub for small farmers, that are trying to get their crops into the school lunch program or get it into other like restaurants and that where you need an aggregation hub. Um, that, that's again, an example of utilizing an existing resource in a new expanded way. Yeah. Thank you. Have, uh, Director Bulahan. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say something. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a comment with me, me being down in Isleton and surrounded by rural and uh, some and folks trying to promote um, outdoor recreation and fishing. And, uh, and, and then me being like just north of the like the greater Bay Area with the, all the barrier folks like moving my way. 
<laughs> so I mean, I mean, I just had a comment about that. It's an issue and I'm glad you're recognizing it. And that's one reason I showed you that cost of community services study. You're not going to have these opportunities if your farmland gets paved over. If you don't protect that farmland, if, if you don't view farmland as its highest and best use, not for housing, and make sure the investments are there to, to take advantage of that crop you're harvesting to do those other activities. And right now we have like a little bit of infill, like um, it was a former cannery site, but now you got like three story houses on there, but it's, it's still undeveloped because um, I guess financing with the developer. So, but yeah, we do have about, I would roughly say 20 homes that are three stories and kind of look out of place in the area. They look almost like townhomes. But yeah, you're right about the, um, like the, uh, you know, like this, the services, it costs more for services. Thank you, Director New. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Humston for her presentation. And um, I'm from w Winters and we've talked about rocks for a long time. And, and we know that um, as a small community, we should be able to do more um, to um, take advantage of our agricultural that's around us. And I heard you say, or I believe I heard you say that this presentation you just did will be available to us because I'd like to see, have other members of our council or, and certainly our city manager uh, see this because you've mentioned so many things that we should be doing or could be doing that uh, I will never be able to uh, pass them all on. But I think that it's, it's probably one of the best presentations I've heard in this area or maybe one of the best presentations I've heard in a long time. And thank you. And I look forward to passing this information on. Yes, and I'd be happy to follow up with them. You know, you, you, Winters, you're right on 505. So you're, you're again, you're, you're, you're part of the region that's poised to be in a perfect place for processing, distribution, packaging activities. Well, we know that and uh, we've got, leadership now that's willing to do this and uh, I, I would like to be in contact with you and and I'll talk to our city manager and pass this all on. Thank you. Thank you. Director Gore, did you have a question? No, I have somebody already mentioned it, so I'm good. I'll let Director Baines go ahead. Perfect. Director Baines. But, but I want to give a shout out to Placer County yes. <clears throat> because I mentioned finance a couple times. I had a limit on how much I could say. So there were so many more things I could have said. But Placer County, I brag about all over the place because you're, I think, county treasurer, Jeannie Winter. Janine Wind and Housen. <laughs> I think that woman's a genius in how she has enabled your county to utilize county funds to invest in a lot of these type of economic development activities. I don't know if you realize how unusual that is, but you guys are the leader in that. And that's exactly the kind of thing other counties ought to be doing more of as far as you know, locally financing the kind of activities I'm talking about means that the profit from the financing stays local as well. It doesn't go to Wall Street. So again, financing. Well, and I, and I appreciate that. I think uh, the, the question, well, the comment I have, which I appreciate was that cost of services um, slide. Because I think we all understand that residential doesn't pay for itself. We need homes, but residential is a drain on a community's resources. Um, but there's that tension um, because we need the housing, but we also, right, it's so clear that we need agriculture. And how do we, how do we balance that? And, and when you see that it costs less to provide those services in your community, um, if you provide that space for agriculture, um, this was just really helpful to me. And I think the thing that I think about in your um, comments is then how do we address the mobility issue, right? Because here we are a SACOG talking about mobility. And I read the SACOG uh, newsletter the other day uh, with this farmer in, I think, Sutter, Yuba County area with the challenge of being able to get his product distributed, right? Because of the traffic, because of the poor roads. And and it really does make me think about that need, which I haven't thought about very often previously, right? The need to make sure that we actually utilize 
our um, traffic dollars or transit dollars or the dollars that we have for transportation to make sure we um, don't neglect that really important commodity, which is getting those crops to market. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Director Baines. But Linda, I just wanna say thank you. Um, I'm a fourth generation farmer myself. Uh, I grow peaches, prunes, walnuts, and almonds. Our family businesses, um, you know, we're diversely, we're, it's a well diverse uh, business, but the programs that you mentioned, I'd love to, you know, see how, how Sutter County could take part in that crop, you know, program and, and see how, how we could benefit as a community in general. You know, I mean, um, Director Gore mentioned you know, Yuba Sutter and us talking about, you know, trying to bring up a third bridge to be able to truck our products to market and also, you know, get them out there. But, but um, this agritourism and all the other opportunities you talked about um, being a hub, I mean, we are a rural agricultural community. And, um, you know, this is to have a hub here to, to bring in or to attract processing and, um, and other things like they have in winters, whether it's breweries, wineries and that, I mean, we have the, um, you know, water is plentiful here. You know, it's not an issue right now, although we're going through a drought. But you see what's happening in Southern California, where a lot of those those farms are going to be coming out of the ground, and people are coming up to this area. But again, um, knowing that we're large enough to where we still can provide those residential units where that's needed to to attract more folks to come in and move to our community. And, um, but I, I did take down your, your contact information on reaching out. I just want to see how, how I could, how I can join you or participate in this to, to help benefit the, our region. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and again, back to the idea of using other resources. You know, um, I, I mentioned fairgrounds, I've mentioned food banks. It could be all kinds of resources that you all have control over. Mendocino County, for example, is really interested in having a small scale a slaughterhouse to take advantage of organic grass-fed livestock that you can't do in larger facilities. And one of the properties they're looking at is property the county owns at the wastewater treatment facility. You know, and what a perfect place to put a slaughterhouse. It kind of stinks, that kind of stinks. <laughs> they can all stink together. No, and you've got the, the wastewater right there. But so, even the opportunities. But they had acreage there. They had some land. And, and that's the kind of thing of looking at, okay, where do you have a resource that maybe you haven't thought about? It could be used a different way. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Hey, it already stinks over there. We'll just... Uh... <laughs> well, and it's near the freeway too, so that was handy. Yeah, Vice Chair Kennedy, I think you have a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. And uh, I have to say that that idea frightens the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> if, Which if, one? Well, if, if you've ever been out to our waste treatment plant at Regional San, and then if you went out to the uh, the rendering plant that is trying to relocate, the smell isn't even close to being the same. Um, I mean, the rendering plant would be way too close to Elk Grove in our area. Um, uh, well, I'm going to say that's probably an old fashioned rendering plant then because the newer ones with air quality um, scrubbers aren't nearly that bad. Okay, then my only suggestion would be to talk to Don Natoli about that. <laughs> so, thanks. Well, thank you. I, um, you know, I just sit here and, and listening to you and I, and I really think what we've been through in the last couple of years really has made a sense of even a stronger sense of pride for our farming and agricultural community. Um, and you're so right. I, when my sons in college were back in beautiful South Bend, Indiana, and I sent my husband to the store so I could make um, a fruit salad. And what he brought home back to the condo, I'm like, are you joking me? This is this it's horrible. And, and I realized I'm not in Sacramento anymore. There's uh, you know, if you want corn, Indiana worked just fine, but uh, we weren't getting grapes and strawberries and, and uh, the blueberries and all the things that we're so fortunate to have such a diverse opportunity here. So it really does instill a sense of pride. And, and I know all of us right now, I mean, I spent this last weekend driving around to some of the local farms in our area and uh, you know, I picked up everything I possibly could have wanted. So it's yeah. a wonderful, we're, we're fortunate where we are and we definitely want to support that. Yeah, and, and again, crossing so many industry clusters, you mentioned driving around, 
One of the things I love, I, I, I'm like a, a little bee that spreads pollen all over the state. That's part of my job. So one of the things I love in Sonoma County they do is um, they do an art trails and link it to their farm trails map and their cheese map and their winery. So you could really, and, and now they're bed and breakfast. So you can really facilitate extra tourism by showing somebody, yeah, you can come up and taste wine, but you can go to an art gallery. You can do this, that, and the other. I mean, there's yeah. just so many creative ways to do that kind of leveraging. Well, and there is a group now doing the um, Harvest Host, the same thing with your RV. And so if you can't find a place to go camping, you can join, I think it's like, you know, $80 a year Harvest yep. Host and park your RV in the winery's parking lot or in the farm's parking lot. And um, you, know, you're, you then contribute by shopping at their local um, their farms, but what a what a creative way to have an agricultural um, and recreation tied together. Yeah, I saw that. I'm going to join that because I think that looks fantastic. Yeah, I did. It was really fun. We've done our first one down in Lodi, and it was awesome. So we'll definitely do it again. And I know we're running out of time. I, I also want to give a shout out to Trish Kelly, who's been a, a key leader working with me for over a decade on all of these issues. And she's not the only one. There's been a lot of great people in your region doing a lot. Uh, Valley Vision has been fantastic. Um, Cecilia Aguilar-Curry, other people. I mean, you just, you, you've had such amazing leadership in your region. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really positioned you to take advantage of some opportunities now, much better than other regions I interact with. Well, thank you. Thank you so much again for joining us. We really appreciate, appreciate the time. My pleasure. All right. Well, we're going to be moving on for an update on the Sacramento Region Parks and Trails Strategic Development Plan. And Victoria Cacciatore is going to be our presenter. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm happy to bring in uh, a very brief update on the Regional Parks and Trails Strategic Development Plan. Uh, we are in the midst of identifying the parks and trails network, so the trail network that is going to extend across all six counties and connect the communities throughout the region. Uh, what you'll see in attachment B are the uh, performance metrics that you reviewed back in June and what we are using as uh, sort of the yardstick or uh, for if we are making progress towards the goals that we've been discussing in terms of uh, what is important to the region, what has risen to the top through our analysis of close to 80 local plans, uh, a handful of regional plans, and then also key state plans that uh, indicate the direction the state is moving uh, in terms of policy and then also the funding that will follow that policy. So we are meeting one-on-one uh, -on -one or one-on-three -on -three with different uh, agencies throughout the region. Uh, sometimes bringing together uh, multiple cities at once uh, where there are particularly uh, interesting cross-jurisdictional uh, boundaries and connections that can be bridged and uh, working towards identifying which locally uh, identified trails are helping us meet those performance metrics. And uh, once we are able to identify the, <laughs> the, the easy to nominate trails, then we're going to work a little bit more to identify where are our gaps. And that is what we'll probably be bringing back perhaps next month uh, in September, seeing where some of those harder to address gaps are and uh, ideally having a draft network for you to review in October and then requesting adoption in November. So that is where we are in the process and what we're working towards. I am very much looking forward to working with uh, my team, Dustin Foster and Maricela Salazar to talk with all of the local staff that will help us understand that how the different trails that you have planned and the connections that they make 
are helping us achieve the different goals uh, that have been identified towards economic vitality and uh, providing equitable access and how we're able to uh, increase the opportunities for active living and uh, especially as it could relate to some of the resource conservation topics that were present in the last conversation, uh, how we're going to be able to connect people uh, in all of our communities to the natural resources that make our region a really great place to live. So if you look at our defining features like all of the rivers that we have, uh, the Sutter Buttes, uh, a lot of people wanting to be able to access those or access those in something other than a car. Uh, and then also, I think some potential for agritourism type activities and how we're going to be able to not so much replicate, but I would envision outperform what they're able to do in the Napa Valley with the Napa Vine Trail. And you can tell them I said that. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, address them. Good if I took myself off mute. Any questions for Victoria? Victoria, I know I do have one. We've talked about each jurisdiction and looking at what they're working on. Are you then looking at the connectors? So if Roseville's working on something and Rockland and Loomis are working on something, will you be the person looking to see how those can connect together? Uh, yes, that is what SACOG is hoping to bring as the value add of how we can create a positive synergy between all of uh, these great efforts that are present at the local level and are identified for, uh, for, for local purposes. But from what we saw with the regional uh, effort, uh, the regional survey that we had earlier this year is that very few people view themselves as constrained to their own jurisdictional boundaries. So if you're living in Rockland, chances are you are going to want to get to Roseville at some point in time or another. And depending on the nature of your activities, uh, what you're going to do once you get to Roseville or once you're in Roseville and you want to get to Rockland, uh, it may be that a bike trip is going to suit your needs quite well, uh, especially given the focus we had on people creating and enhancing their communities by having places where they can go to uh, to be a part of the community, such as uh, whether they're going to meet up with friends or going to different uh, civically sponsored events, such as uh, one of the ones I remember offhand is uh, talking about how they would have fireworks at 4th of July at this one park in Elk Grove. And a lot of people go to it uh, and they, they wanted to be able to bike to it for this community event. They would have been driving otherwise. Uh, so they're uh, looking for the opportunities to build community in that way. So wonderful. the long way, yes, sorry. Oh gosh, oh, wonderful. Any other questions on our trail system? All right, well, thank you very much. We'll look forward to the next update and uh, we will then be moving on to our next item. And actually it's time for a committee report. So it's just an opportunity if anyone has anything they'd like to share um, about what's happening in their, in their community, this would be your chance. I know there's probably so much happening, you can't narrow it down. You know, I could, this could make it even tougher. I could just pick on somebody. <laughs> All right. Oh, see, thank you. Director Harris has something to share. Well, you are welcome. That's a tough spot to be in when you're just trying to get the momentum of the meeting going. So <laughs> I will step in and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something related to economy and everything. It's something that we're very excited about up here. In addition to our uh, pending uh, trail and the reclaim railroad right away down there out to the Buttes and beyond. But um, we're, we uh, have been partnering with, uh, um, well, not partnering. I've been in these discussions with our chamber of commerce 
Yeah, oh, let me turn my camera on. Sorry. With uh, our Chamber of Commerce, and we're, we decided that we're going to uh, create a film commission. And there's a very vibrant one up in uh, Shasta County, and they've really shown some positive results for their, their economy. And we, we, we've dabbled in the idea of uh, tourism and whatnot. And, you know, it's struggling to get to get that ball rolling. But we have decided that, you know, maybe we have an opportunity here to showcase our area um, in film, whether it be music video or commercials or short films or feature films or documentaries, you name it. Um, they still need to come that they, they, they eat, they buy gas, they, they will uh, stay the night, uh, they will hire hopefully some crew locally. And um, maybe even, you know, if we score and get a really big uh, film here, you know, look at the, uh, a more obvious example would be look at how many people still go to Bodega Bay just to see the uh, famous schoolhouse from the movie The Birds, right? So you have that residual kind of hard to track, but it's still going to show um, some difference, uh, hopefully make a difference. And I talked to a guy today who has a pilot TV program he wants to start. He's already got $100,000 in investment and they're, he's going to probably going to be our guinea pig um, for our film commission. So uh, more, to, more to come on that, we hope. Uh, we're really excited about it. So I just thought I'd throw it out there. Thank you very much. That's awesome. And you're right. When you go to Bodega Bay, you go to see where the birds are, clearly because we're still scarred from the movie as children. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I can tell you just to, on, in Rockland, I, I probably had mentioned a few years ago, we had an opportunity to buy, uh, we had a, a Sunset Whitney golf course that had been here for since the early 60s. And it had, uh, they had closed it down a few years back. And about three years ago now, the city was able to purchase that 180 acres dead center in Rockland. Um, of course, we have 37 parks in our 20 square miles, and this was not in the plan to add 180 acres, but we've been amazed to see through COVID in particularly, we opened up two and a half miles of the old cart paths that were in good shape that we were able to open for walking trails. And they don't go anywhere, but it's just a beautiful area. And they've been absolutely the most popular thing I've seen in years. And we're really excited that we've just uh, been able to work through a grant and some of our local funding. And we're getting ready to open another three quarters of a mile that we were able to make ADA accessible. And we've got a long way to go. But boy, it's so true. If you build it, they'll come. It's unbelievable how many people are out there to, to walk to our trails to nowhere right now. So I'm very hopeful we'll connect and We'll make a way to get them to Loomis and they can go get some ice cream at Taylor's and then head to Roseville on their great trail system and um, do a little shop in that direction. So hopefully you'll see a little more Sunset Whitney recreation area soon. Okay, well, I know it's we're just warming up. So we will uh, hopefully next, our next meeting, you'll have a, a 10 other things that we need to add to it. So other, other item we have is just a receive and file. Dov, anything you wanted to share on the blueprint imp implementation? No updates. I'm sorry, I, oh, you're muted. I think, he, I think he said no updates, sorry. All right, Chair Gallo, yeah, no updates. Uh, it's just a receive and file item to track all of the blueprint activities we have. Perfect. Well, thank you all. It is wonderful to see you even virtually. I'm, uh, um, I'm hopeful, I know we're all getting excited to get back, well, to get back to work. Now we're actually starting to implement some things we've been doing while we've been uh, in a little bit of lockdown, but I, hopefully things are going well in your communities. Thank you all for being here and I'll look forward to seeing you next month. With that, we're adjourned. <laughs>